I'm going to record it, and I'm going to simulcast it on... Yeah, I'm going to simulcast it on the Carto. In case you get you don't like the um, the clunkiness of the GoToMeeting because it's really choppy, you can always go to the... Ah, uh, oh, here's a go. Okay, cool. You can always go to the Picardo or Twitch, and I'll give you both. I get my keyboard. I'll give you both of those links. I usually, um, so I'm, I usually live broadcast my my own personal practice every day on. Uh oh, encoding overloaded. I've got too many things open. Oh well, it will just have to suffer. Uh, let's see. What can I quit? I can quit Photoshop. I can quit Excel. I can quit Word. Oh, and I'm recording. Let me stop recording. For, I hope I'll survive. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about blind contours. And the reason that we do blind contours and the reason and the things they don't explain to you about it is that if, you re, if you're in the reading material, you're reading the material about the left brain and the right brain. Um, we have one brain, yes, but it has two hemispheres, a left hemisphere and a right hemisphere. So the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body and the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. So most of us, most people are right-handed. That's a dominant, not everybody, but most. And the left side of the brain has all the language, keeps track of all the time, um, makes sure that uh, everything's logical and orderly and is very involved with doing things quickly, like a computer almost, you know, it's like symbolic. Just take the, it, take the idea and put it in storage and you can pull it out later for something else. The right side of the brain, which controls the left side of the body, is um, very, it doesn't have any sense of time and it doesn't really use language. It uses images, pictures, intuition, gut feeling, that kind of um, spatial understanding of how the world works. And it moves, since it doesn't have a sense of time, it moves really at its own pace, which is not the pace of the left brain. So you need both sides in order to really function um, as a human being. And some people are stronger on one side than the other, and that's fine. And even if you're right hand, left-handed, it doesn't mean that your hemispheres are reversed. It's the same idea. The thing about the left brain is that it, since it has language and it's kind of in control, it's like the boss because it's the one that's right up front. After you start talking and, and becoming a civilized human being, it takes over and controls everything. And then we stop, take away all your crayons and your paints and make you study math and things like that. Um, since it has language, it names everything. So you'll notice that sometimes there'll be a, you can catch a little bit of a uh, linguistic, um, kind of like a jab, a little linguistic jab at the other side of the brain, the nonverbal side. Because if somebody gives you, for instance, a left-handed compliment is like not a very good compliment. The right hand, which is controlled by the left brain, is dexterous. It's Dexter. It's right. It's correct. It's always the, you know, you raise your right hand when you, you do, uh, you know, take the oath and all that stuff. And most people write with their right hand, not all. But we also use the written word, at least in the English, uh, and most in the Latin, Latinesque languages, we go from left to right. So it's very much this very dominated um, if you are into heraldry, which I, I am, which is really cool because I just got into, uh, just finished reading all the Game of Thrones books too, and they do a lot of heraldry. So you have the, uh, the left side of the shield is called Sinister, and the right side of the shield is called Dexter. So you have Dexter and Sinister. Sinister is dark and evil, and sometimes just being left-handed, people look at you funny. Um, anyway, so... The reason we do blind contours, and you'll notice that I'll get off on all kinds of crazy uh, tangents just because I can and I enjoy it. Um, I'm like a, a little little ADHD, I guess. It's like, oh, shiny object. When you're doing a blind contour, the point is to look at your hand that you're not drawing with and not look at your paper or your drawing hand. That seems like that's impossible. But what you want to do is in your mind, you want to make yourself really small and get like a little, like you're a little tiny ant and you're just crawling along the edge of your hand. This is so you kind of 
it's a couple of reasons. One is so that you learn about edges. Now, remember, there there are no lines in nature. There are only edges. Edges of uh, one substance stops and another substance starts, like your flesh stops and the air starts, for instance. Or looking at my hands in front of you on the screen, there's no outline around my hands. There's an edge where the hand stops and the paper shows up and the cat joins in just for kicks. Um, anyway, so you want to slow way, way down and just draw along the edge of all the surfaces that you can see in your hand. It should take you at least 15 or 20 minutes and it will look really, really weird. And that's okay because it should. If it looks too real, then I'm going to know you're cheating. And if it looks too simple, I'm going to know you're going too fast and not taking the time that you need to do. The idea is to make the left brain get bored and go away and leave you alone for a while so that you can actually explore the intuitive, spatial, creative side. Does that make sense? Anybody have any questions so far? That's my typical lecture I give to on-ground classes. And I, I've never done that to a online class before because usually all that information is in the texts and the reading materials, but who wants to read when you can, you know, talk and interact? So I'm not going to do this for the whole 15 minutes like you should, but I will do it for probably five minutes and it may get really, really boring, but that's okay because I want you to see how it's done. Tape your paper down like so. Uh, the instructions in the class say to hold something in your hand one more piece of tape down here so that you don't move your paper. I would prefer that you do a fully blind contour. In other words, don't look at your paper at all. But if you just can't stand it because your left brain will scream at you and it will reach out and grab you by the neck and choke you and say, look at the paper. If you have to, you have to stop drawing and don't move your pencil. If you have to reposition your pencil, then you can pick it up once, put it down someplace else, but don't move that pencil until you look away from it because I don't want you to be looking at your pencil when you're drawing. I want you to be looking at your hand. Okay. So turn yourself so you can't see paper and don't cheat. This is really important. Don't cheat. I will know if you are cheating. And I am going to hold, I'm just going to hold a ball in my hands because I can. This is here. This is a cue ball. It's a great prop, something that you should all um, get hold of because we're going to be doing sphere drawings next week. Okay. My daughter's singing. I, I could put on some light dinner music in the background just so it's not quite so boring. Let's uh let's put on a little bit of uh cool guitar stuff. Okay. So put on some music. Don't talk. And don't let anybody talk to you. Let's see. I will actually I will put uh I'm going to put on a secondary camera so that you guys can see my hand as I draw. That should be interesting. I haven't done this before yet either. Let's see how this works. I do have a secondary camera. I have many cameras. And when we draw still life, we will be looking at those cameras too. Okay, so let me turn this one on. camera I want. Ha. So here's my hand. It's not going to be exactly from your direction, but near enough that you should be able to see what I'm working with here. Oh, God, what a mess. All right. So blind contour. Try to hold your hand in a way that seems kind of interesting so that you don't bore yourself to death. Like, don't do just this because that's no fun, and then you got all those fingers to deal with. Try to find something that's kind of, kind of cool and interesting to look at. All right. Now, my view, I could put it on my shoulder so you could see my view, is like this. Maybe that's what I'll do. I'll put it on my shoulder. So it makes it all dark. Oh, because of the screen. 
there we go. This might work. This is kind of cool. You can see my messy office, but that's all right. I'm going to look at my hand. Okay, so you can start, and I would use a ballpoint pen or a very soft pencil. And I'm going to start at the bottom of my wrist, and I'm going to pretend I'm a little tiny ant. And I'm just going to crawl up my wrist bone. And I want you to go this slowly. And I don't want you to really talk like I am. Now, I got a few little wrinkles here and there, sadly. I'm just going to keep on carrying on this long expanse up the back of the hand. You can move your arm, but don't pick up your pencil. And here comes a little lump. And then back out and then go around the next little lump and back out and the next one. Now I'm going to start crawling up the finger here. So just crawling along the edge. And anytime you see any kind of a little line or a bump or a crevice or a wrinkle, go for it. I don't have a ring on this finger, so that makes it easier. Now I've kind of backtracked on myself, so i got to figure out. I'm going to go, mm, I'll go back around the ring again. At least what I think is the ring. And start up the second finger. Okay, so did you guys all fall asleep? Did you get the idea? This is uh, it's it's a challenge, and it won't work if you're talking or if somebody's talking to you while you're doing it. You should definitely um, try to really make yourself tiny and get in there. You see, it it looks sort of like my hand, but it doesn't look exactly like my hand. I actually did that okay where I'm going back around the ring and then the knuckle and then the finger. And I would keep going and then go around the ball. And But you want to go slow, and that's super important. Slow as possible. And your left brain will scream at you, and then all of a sudden it will shut up after about 10 minutes. And you'll ideally you'll lose track of time. And once you've lost that sense of time or that sense of, of anxiety and hurry, hurry, rush, rush, 
you'll be switching to that alpha mode in your brain. It's the right brain mode that will allow you to become more spatial and more creative, more intuitive. Um, before you know it, you'll be where you're going. It's like when you're driving and you don't remember driving. It's kind of that sort of thing. It's like daydreaming. And it's a really cool feeling. So once you've figured out how to make that switch, that's going to be a major breakthrough for you if you're new to drawing. If you're not new to drawing, you may do this all the time. Um, you guys have any questions? No questions? None at all? Not even one little tiny question? Or complaint? Oh, you guys are too easy. Come on, you got to make it harder for me. You got to keep me interested too, you know? <laughs> okay, so when you're drawing your still life, any still life, whether you're doing a gesture drawing or you're doing um, an interior drawing or you're drawing a portrait or whatever you're drawing, when you're drawing from life, make sure you have good lighting. Of course, if you're outside, you have to put up with the lighting that nature gives you, but it's usually not too bad. It's just the only problem with outside lighting is it changes. So the best thing to do with uh, when you're drawing outside is to only to try to draw between the hours of 10 and 2 because that's when the light changes the least. So milestone, task two of the milestone for observational drawing is to do a uh, do gestures of plant life. So house plants, you know, I'm gonna, I've got a pumpkin I'm going to draw. Um, I, I've got other plants, but they're really big. So anyway, it goes quickly. And the gesture isn't so much that it's the, not the gesture of the object that you're drawing. It's moving, but you are trying to grab the energy from the gesture. This is my interpretation. I, the, paper, the books might and the readings might say something a little bit different, but how I interpret it is your gesture is going to be... Ha Hi, Michael. <laughs> Your mic works. Um, it's going to be how you capture the energy of the of what you're looking at and trans transport it to your energy of your drawing. That sounds very you know mamby pamby sort of like a you know fluffy art speak, but it is what it is. So I want you guys to see at least a little bit more like what I'm seeing. Okay, so, and there's a candle in there, but we won't pay much attention to it. So you want to start with keep it loose. This is another thing that's important. You should have, oh, before I go that, before I even get into that, when you're drawing from observation, you must always have your drawing board tilted up, either on an easel, so it's in front of you, or on a drawing board, like I have, uh, my drawing board is, uh, has an angle on it. See, it's an angle on it. It's not perfect. It's not exactly square to my face, but I put the camera square to it so that you guys get a good view because I can work around the bad view or I can stand up if I need to. Um, the other thing you can do, put your still life in front of you, set your drawing board up against your table and set the drawing board on your knees so that it's at an angle. So whatever you're doing, when you're sitting drawing a still life, you've got something here on the table that you're in during draw and you're sitting here in front of it on a chair hopefully or a stool or whatever but if you're sitting on a chair like so your drawing board is angled like this so that you can see it directly whoops and yeah, you can't see that because I didn't put it in the light so you can look up at your still life and then you can look down at your board and so you're drawing see I can draw um, that comes from playing Pictionary you've got to draw symbolically and I'm not warmed up yet that's another thing is you got to warm up. So make sure that you're always drawing like this. If you have a tape, you're drawing on a table and you're drawing flat, you're sitting here in your chair or on your stool or wherever and you're drawing here, you're looking at this picture at an angle and then you're looking at whatever it is that you're drawing, a person or whatever. And what exact, essentially what happens is you're going to get this point of view on your drawing, right? So you're going to end up drawing the top of it either too big or too small. I can't remember how it goes, but at any rate, it'll be distorted. And I can tell, I can tell if you've been drawing flat because your drawings will be distorted. So don't do that. Pull this over a little bit further. There we go. 
there. Okay. Any questions on this so far? You guys all good? And if you're just joining us and you're in one of my classes, please make sure you put your last name up in on your name as well so that I know that you're in the class so that I can give you credit for being here. If you're not in one of my classes and you're just here for fun, you can put whatever you want for your name. I don't mind. Just as long as it's clean. Keep it clean. I'm also um, simulcasting on Twitch and Picardo, although I'm not actually logged in, so I'm not seeing the chats on those. So if you guys are on Twitch or Picardo watching me, I can't see what you're saying. So sorry, this time. Next time I'll load in the chat as well. Okay. So keeping it loose, keep your shoulder, keep it loose. You want to draw from your shoulder. Don't draw from here. If you're drawing like this, you're going to have very small, painful little drawings, and you're going to get and get some trouble with your hand, which is what I've got. I'm trying to look at the camera, but I always forget to look at the camera. I'm not really a television person, but um, all right, enough said. Should I take you a couple of minutes to, to sketch out a basic gesture drawing? So I start with the pot that it's in, because I can, and then the try to get a good feel for. Now, it's just very simple drawing because it's a very simple plant and I might put in a little more detail but keep it loose keep it quick keep it full of energy make sure it has life to it if you want to add a little shading I would say just a touch don't get in there start filling up stuff you want to keep it really loose um, I'm going to turn the plant and do it from a different angle so you should do 50 60 70 80 still lives now adjust your drawings before you start drawing anyway, because you got to warm up. I'm going to put my pumpkin in there with it. That makes it a little more interesting. Okay, so now I've got my pumpkin in there with my plant. Even though I'm not doing a lot of sh shading or shadowing, you still want to have good light, because the light is what defines the form, and the form is what you're trying to draw. If anything I say doesn't make any sense, Oh, cool. Hi, Megan. I'm glad you're back. Yeah, you can come anytime. You can come all the time. And I, I broadcast live on uh, on Twitch and Picardo now, too. So, um, But that's my own stuff. I'm doing what I want to do. Here, I, I, there's sessions I try to do something that's actually helpful to people that are in school. <laughs> all right, cool. Um, all right, so I'm going to do this again. And like as you can see, it only takes a few seconds. I hope that I'm more interesting than the guy in the classroom. I'm pretty sure I am because even I can't watch the videos of the guy in the classroom. So, oh, God, I hope my boss isn't here. <laughs> so I've got my plant. Keep it loose. You can hold your pencil. Like, try different grips, too. Don't keep it always holding it tight in one hand. And if you're left-handed, if you're left-handed, forget everything they taught you about writing and because you're not writing. You're drawing. And you can draw from your left to your right. Just like I'm drawing from my, you can draw from your right to your left. I mean, <laughs> so I'm drawing from a left to my right. So you'll be able to see for the first time ever. You might, won't have to go like this. You'll actually be able to see what you're drawing. I think that's pretty cool. I, I just discovered that last term when I was uh, helping somebody who was left-handed, and I realized that they were hurting themselves the way they were drawing. <laughs> you don't need to do that. It's not necessary to be in pain. It really isn't. Okay. I wish I had a tech person that could take care of all the other tech stuff. It's just me, and I'm all by myself. So here's my pot. Every drawing that you start in this class, and hopefully in any other drawing that you do, any composition that you do, you're going to start with a gesture drawing, partly to get the feel of the energy of whatever it is that you're drawing, partly to develop an eye for proportions, it's also really hard to talk and draw at the same time, so. And I got shadows on this side because the light's on the left. Oh, and there's even something back there. I might put that in there too, just for kicks. And if I get really fancy, I could put in the drapery. But there's that's what I'm expecting to see for a gesture drawing of plant material. 
loose and free and comfortable and hopefully relatively in a reasonable simile of proportion to what you've actually got in front of you. So the gesture drawing is extremely important for establishing space and um, relationships and as well as we're going to do figure drawing next, which is what I really love to do, the line of action and the motion, and then you really are drawing energy that you're getting from the moving figure or the, the live figure. And um, anybody have any questions? Okay, no questions. I'm going to do this one more time. Um, I'm going to turn it a little bit just to make it interesting. Let's see. You can also go outside and draw if it's warm enough where you are. It's not warm enough where I am. And I have cat hair in my plant, but we won't tell anybody that, right? I'm going to put this up here. Um, hmm? No, nope. maybe I'll do it like this. So I don't really mind what you draw, but it it should at least resemble natural material. Okay, so here's what I'm seeing pretty much. And the camera's in the way for me a little bit, but I'm going to draw around it. Okay. And that's really coming towards me, so I've got a lot of depth going on here. And the camera, now the camera distorts it, so that's why you have to draw from life. You have to draw from observation. Even if you do end up working from photographs occasionally, and it's fine to work from photographs occasionally, but a photograph is flat, and a real thing is not. And you want to try to recreate a real, a, a not flat thing on your on your drawing surface, right? Everybody wants to make everything look real. I got to practice looking at the camera instead of looking at my own picture. <laughs> you guys will help me with that, right? Okay, so. Now, the assignment, the task says three of your best gestures. Please draw more than three. Don't just settle for the first three drawings that you do. You'll find that the more you draw, the better and better it will get. It's really like doing your stretches. Oh, I made that leaf up too high. It's really like doing your stretches before you go for a run. You don't want to pull an art muscle. It could leave you crippled for a week. And I probably make really funny faces when I draw. I often wonder if that's why musicians make funny faces, because we get all interested in what we're doing and we pay no attention to anything else. So there's my pumpkin plant. I can put a little more here. Not too much, though. Don't overwork it. Just don't overwork it. I'm going to do it one more time, and I'm not going to talk this time. I'll probably get a better drawing. Cheap paper, backs of old bills, love letters from ex girlfriends and boyfriends, just, you know, don't worry about the kind of paper that you're using to do the quick gesture sketches on. You can just go ahead and draw on anything that you've got at hand. I use charcoal because I like the dark mark that it makes. It makes a nice, it's a robust mark, whereas uh, pencil can sometimes be a little wimpy. Sometimes you'll notice when I'm drawing for you guys, I might start leaning over my drawing board because I really do want to see it straight on and my head gets in the way. Let me get another pencil. Actually, I will draw with vine because I think that's part of the assignment. This is vine charcoal. If you're not familiar with vine, it's really nasty, <laughs> difficult to work with. Um, it's very, uh, it has some advantages. It's rather, um, Fugitive, so like you can make a nice dark mark, but you can also rub it off pretty easily, and you can reuse your paper over and over and over again, which is great for life drawing classes. But it's just a piece of burnt up twig. So remember, when the apocalypse comes and there's no electricity and all the computers are dead, as long as you can burn a twig and find a flat sh surface to make a mark on, you can still be an artist. All right. I'm killing it tonight, aren't I, guys? Okay. And you definitely are going to be holding it like this. You're not going to be holding it like a pencil. You're going to hold it like this. 
Well, that's right. I said I wouldn't talk. There's a real line of action right there that even though that stem is dead, it has life in it. It has motion to it. So try to feel that life in your drawings. So I think vine charcoal is pretty good for quick gesture drawings. I tend to use charcoal pencils because I like the control. I'm a little bit of a control freak. So um, I don't mind what you actually, sorry, it was a gnat what you guys actually draw with in the long run, as long as you try a little bit of everything. Well, charcoal is not, you should try, keep trying working with charcoal because that that's the vine charcoal. I'm gonna do one more drawing <laughs> before we go to the figure. And I'm gonna do it with compressed charcoal instead, which is the big blocky stuff. I'm sure that you guys all have that. If you don't have your materials for some reason, don't freak out, just draw with whatever you can. Just please don't draw with anything harder than a 2H or a 2B, a 2B pencil. I don't even have anything harder than a 2B. Um, if you don't know about pencils, they go from 9H down to 2H and then B, HB and then B and then 2B and then all the way up to 9B. So the B means soft. So the higher the number on the B, the softer and darker the, the graphite is. The higher on the H, the harder and lighter it is. If you're a drafts person, draft, uh, if you're doing drafting, you're going to probably use two and four H's. If you're a drawing, you're going to be using four and six B's. At least that's what I do. So I'm going to turn this one more time just so I don't get too bored. You got to keep it. Oh, I broke my plant. Oh, that's so sad. No wonder it was hanging so funny. Oh, well. Say, Libby, put it like this instead. Okay, and now I'm going to use the compressed charcoal, which is good for certain things, particularly making really dark darks, really rich colors. What's nice about the compressed charcoal is you can turn it on its side and do some fancy line quality. We'll talk a lot about line quality. You want to have a variation in line. Try to push light and push heavy. Um, if you've got shadows, you can turn it on its side, give it some nice you know, form shadows there, a little shadow right there. So if you're gonna do any shading, shadowing, I would expect that kind of shadowing, not a thin line fill. Okay. Now, before I go to the regular figure drawing, does anybody have any questions about these two tasks for the first milestone or anything in the material so far? Do you typically do shadowing and gesture drawings? Depends. It depends on, um, because you can do a one minute, two minute, five minute, 10 minute gesture. The plants, yeah. um, I would say try different lengths. We're going to be doing time gestures for the figures because you have a model. It's, they're going to pose for you. Um, you don't yeah. want to make them stand there forever and ever. And holding certain poses, like you can get a really dynamic pose for a minute and then a really languid pose for 20 minutes. So um, if you are, I would do a variety. Do some with and some without. Try them both ways and try different materials too. You might find that you like working with ballpoint pen. You might find that you like working with this pen, which is what I like to work with. This is a Kuretake Japanese calligraphy pen. So I'll do, I'll do a drawing in that. Sometimes I think it's really good to draw with, uh, I like to draw on a slick paper when I do that though. It's really good to draw with a pen 
because it keeps you uh, keeps you honest. I don't see my slick paper anywhere nearby, so I'm just going to I'll save that for another time. But basically, the Karataki pen will give you beautiful. You know, you can get all kinds of interesting line work here. You can do. This is why you want a slick paper because the newsprint soaks up the ink too much. I've got regular drawing paper. I'll try that too. So it gets a little rough if you have slick. If you have a slickery paper, it's going to make a, a much nicer line. But you can get some really interesting textural things going on. And uh, it's fun to draw with. And it also keeps you from being tempted to erase. You shouldn't be erasing anything in a gesture drawing. I mean, unless it's like a major faux pas, and then you might as well just start over because it's just a quick drawing. It's nothing to uh, nothing to, to put. If it turns out amazing, put it on your wall. But newsprint doesn't keep. So these are really great. The pens are expensive. They're about 15, between 15 and $30, depending on where you buy it. But the cartridges are amazingly cheap. You can get five of these ink cartridges for like two bucks. So it's totally like a Japanese way of thinking. You spend a lot of money for the good, solid thing and not much money for the stuff that you throw away. All right. So let me try. Still remember, don't tight, don't get too tight when you draw. Try to keep it loose. And when you get in and doing detail, you're going to have to get tight. But for these kinds of drawings, and I'm still, I don't feel very warmed up, so I'm a little bit, I'm a little more tentative. But I do love drawing with the Karataki pen because it's a great instrument. I think having really happy music when you're drawing gesture drawings helps a lot too. I see a little bit of the plant here. So for my shadowing on this, I might hatch a little bit, maybe, or maybe come in with a little bit here, maybe do a little bit of hatching here, but it's not going to be any real heavy, heavy shadowing. Mostly what we're trying to do is capture the form. I have to draw with better paper. Sorry. Well, I wanted to show you my pen, but... It's actually a real brush. It's not a felt tip. Okay. You can even use Sharpies. You know, just draw with whatever's at hand. The important thing is that you draw and draw every day. And I live by that. Okay. So you guys ready to... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and post this in the classroom for the observational design people. Observational